Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's December 2023, and you're listening to episode 370, which is a conversation about the ministry of Sheila Ray Gregoire. Today's guest is Anne Kennedy. She has an MDiv and is the author of Nailed It, 365 Readings for Angry or Worn Out People, and blogs about current events and theological trends at standfirminfaith.com and on her substack called Demotivations with Anne. Anne has written an in-depth feature article called Sheila Ray Gregoire, Sex and the Evangelical Girl. You can read her article completely for free, no paywall, on our website, Equip.org. Anne, it's good to have you on the podcast again. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. Well, today we're talking about the teaching of author Sheila Ray Gregoire, and she is a known speaker, blogger, writer, and she has an active social media presence. And so some of our listeners might not know who she is, and some might have read some of her marriage books. So who is Sheila Gregoire, and how has her thoughts on, well, basically she's a speaker aimed at uh, Christian women, so how is her thoughts for Christian marriage from, I guess, the woman's point of view, and also sexuality, because she's known for that, developed over the years. As a matter of fact, when I've been on social media, sometimes when there's been some dust steps, especially as it relates to marriage and those kinds of issues, you see on social media so many people saying, hey, you need to read Sheila Gregoire. So who is she and and what is kind of her, her area of uh, focus? Sheila Ray Gregoire is a Canadian woman. She podcasts. Her main platform podcast is called Bare Marriage. She does a lot of sort of content production with her daughter and more and more her husband and then another person on their team who has co-authored with them who's her name is Joanna Swatsky. So I think as far as I can glean, Gregoire really got started in the way that a lot of us did by getting on the internet in the early 2000s and beginning to blog about things that mattered to her, which in that case was marriage and family. And her church uh, recognized that she had kind of a gift for speaking and and teaching and began to promote her. And she gradually, her blog, which is extremely popular, was called To Love, Honor, and Vacuum. And kind of built up a, a following at that point and eventually transferred over to the Bare Marriage podcast but she really kind of burst on the scene, I think, in uh, 2020. I always getting that that whole period is so muddled to me. But somewhere in the era of COVID, her the her book, The Great Sex Rescue, came out, and that ended up being a New York Times bestseller. And she uh, followed that up with a very popular book that's just come out called this year called She Deserves Better. Uh, raising girls to resist toxic teachings on sex, self, and speaking up. So she, I think, in the early period was kind of a run of the mill, you know, evangelical writing about marriage and family. And there was kind of a consensus back then, I think, about how marriage, what marriage should look like, and you know, family, and even even sort of messaging around sex. Uh, and then. Uh, from what I can glean, around 2016, I think she began to feel disaffected with the status quo at that point. And she began uh, around 2019, she says, to read more carefully a lot of the different books and material that had been, you know, assumed as regular normal content for most Christians. 
and to really question them. And she began to do surveys and to try to do what she calls a little bit more scientific research about that messaging to discover if it if it's helpful or not. And so now she's extremely popular and uh, she's on Twitter or X. And I I stumbled into it a little bit because I hadn't heard of her and I had never read her at all. And then I came across her book, uh, She Deserves Better. And I blogged about it. You know, I'm a blogger too. And I discovered that a lot of people in my circle, a lot of personal friends really have been helped by, by her content. And I, I kind of stepped on some toes unwittingly. And then I ended up being uh, blocked on X for <laughs> continuing to write about her content. So in the same vein that a lot of us are just sort of online, I think that that's, that's kind of how she got her start. But she, has, she does produce a lot of material on the subject of sex and marriage and now um, sex for teenagers on her platforms. Well, one of the ways in which Sheila Gregoire came to my attention that I alluded to earlier was earlier this year, there was a huge dust up with then TGC contributor Josh Butler and his new book on marriage. And so because people were thinking that his approach was not biblical, I saw on X, formerly Twitter, so many people referring to the work of Sheila Gregoire specifically on marriage. So what is her approach and view about a Christian marriage? Well, she, this is the part where I already am sort of conflicted. So she talks about marriage and she is a Christian or claims to be a Christian. And so I also read Butler's book and I, I wrote about it and I did find, you know, certain sort of very big issues with Butler's book. But he, if, if you say one thing about him, he definitely leaned heavily into this spiritual dimensions of sex in marriage and the theological view of it, it like in a, a very explicit way. Uh, I would say that Gregoire leans completely on the other side of that, that she really doesn't get into the spiritual side of sex at all or much. And although she appeals to theology and, and Christianity, she doesn't really delve into it. Uh, she does. The big thing that she is interested in is its mutuality. So she defines that she spends the first part of the great sex rescue redefining sex or not really redefining it, but being more careful about what uh, what it means or what it is. And she sort of steers away from its pure physicality, that it's just two people, you know, having sex, as you would say, and that it's the bearing of oneself, one's soul with the other person, both physically and emotionally. And so it's very important that sex be, well, she has a list here. It should be personal, pleasurable, pure, prioritized, and pressure-free. And then you should put the other person first. And then the, the big one is that it should be passionate. She believes that sex should be, she says, a state of joyful abandon to completely surrender ourselves to the other in an ecstasy of trust and love. And so... That's sort of the basis for how she would talk about sex. And she does bring in the Bible at different points, but that's really not her focus. It's more about the mechanics of making sure that it's mutual and pleasurable and non-coercive and functional, I guess. <laughs> that we might say that it's, you know, it's a good time for both people. That's her main focus. She's really concerned about making sure that women don't miss out on great sex in marriage. And so if you're looking for a sort of a theology of sex, that's not where she's focused. It's how the people in the mechanics in their engagement with each other, how they can both have a good time. Uh, and that's that's great. It does 
the problem is that it does bleed over eventually into theology. And by keeping it so narrowly focused on the material and physical and even emotional and not having really any correspondence with the, the spiritual and theological dimensions of sex and marriage, she ends up falling into a number of errors that are really concerning. That is fascinating because in some recent podcasts that Surai President Hank Hanegraaff has done about the modern feminist movement with the various different scholars, in particular Roman Catholic scholar Carrie Gress, she has talked about how the feminist movement really moved sexuality away from a fully orbed biblical understanding, which also included, it wasn't exclusively for this, but also included procreation to a more, I guess, secular and modern understanding that it was primarily only for pleasure. It didn't disclude pleasure, but that was the main pursuit, specifically as the feminist movement over the many decades has seen it. So I find that very interesting. So how has her work really been helpful for both men and women? Because during the whole Josh Butler situation, many men were recommending various pastors and different teachers, Christian men, on X, formerly Twitter, that people read her book. And as Anne noted, I want our listeners to Now, if they're newer to this podcast, she mentioned reading Josh Butler's book. She did a deep dive review of that book, and you can find both her review in a written form and our podcast discussion on our website, equip.org. But how has Gregoire's work impacted both men and women? Well, so I think she's a, a really interesting figure because if you said only one thing about the last 50 years, it's that not only the evangelical and Christian world have been kind of in a tumult over sex, sexuality, and identity, but, I mean, the whole world has had this as its main source of discomfort and anxiety. And so there are a lot of voices out there. And I think one reason why through the 90s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, there were so many books written about marriage and sex amongst them books like Love and Respect and Sheet Music, that, you know, there's plenty to critique and there's plenty of content. There's plenty of stuff, but a lot of the content that's been available to evangelical Christians has left them feeling deeply dissatisfied. And so I think, you know, into that sort of melee, Gregoire steps and she has a pretty sharp critical voice. She's a clear communicator and she is able to point out what and on her website she says, do all these Christian books make you feel icky? And I think that's probably a common feeling. You know, I I didn't actually read Love and Respect very much. I opened it up, I skimmed some, and then I was, you know, embarrassed and the same with sheet music. But I don't enjoy reading and talking about this subject as much as anybody would believe because based on my content online, but she's a good critic of what's wrong with a lot of this content or the proverbial wisdom that evangelicalism has had to work with over the last 25, 30, or 50 years. And so I think she, especially in the aftermath of the purity the movement, the purity culture, which sort of reached its zenith and then crumbled when Josh Harris apostatized. She's been one of the main voices that has clarified and articulated what people didn't like about all of that stuff. And it was, I think she kind of had the benefit or has the benefit of being right at the right moment. What she's saying is what people are feeling. And so she's hitting a chord. I think, you know, people were really uncomfortable with the Butler book and they might not have known why. And then she came in and gave good reasons or articulated what seems to most people like the problem. So she's kind of the right voice at the right time, I think, for many people. And I think a lot of a lot of people in my own life, you know, lived through that 
era of evangelicalism unquestioning a lot of it. They just sort of, we all just sort of swam in that bath. And then the cracks showed and uh, it's disorienting. And so she's very much a person that you can kind of grasp onto and feel like, feel steady to feel like she's making sense of the world and um, giving meaning to things that maybe appeared meaningless before. Each December is a time when I know that people are considering their year-end charitable donations. And while the Christian Research Journal content is completely free, it is no longer a paid subscription magazine, and all of our articles and podcasts are free at our website, equip.org. We still have a budget for the journal because we pay our authors and we use staff to produce all of this great content that you find from us. We have an editorial team and we have the staff of engineering and video folks that help us put together our Postmodern Realities podcast. Well, there's two ways if you would like to consider a partnering donation at the end of the year to help support the Christian Research Journal. So what you can do is go to our website, equip.org. If you scroll down, you'll see a section with four different graphics, gifts for your donation. Two of those relate to the Christian Research Journal. One is you could give a partnering gift for a copy of one of the books of some of our Christian Research Journal authors that you hear featured, like Hilary Ferrer from Mama Bear Apologetics. We have a book on the Mormon missionary message from Corey Miller, and also a new book from longtime contributor Doug Grothuis. But the other way that you might want to support the Christian Research Journal with a partnering gift is to donate for our very special last issue of the Christian Research Journal. So you get the last print issue ever published. It is a collector's item and you can donate for one copy, two, four, seven, or 10 copies if you want to give some of those out. And it's a special themed issue about the war on Western civilization. As a matter of fact, I recently had a podcast conversation with Matt Kennedy about his article on Christian parenting and public education, which is in that issue. And of course, we did feature earlier this summer John Ferrer, and he talked about how Christians need to handle some of these different issues about inclusion and special seminars that you might encounter in your workplace. So at the end of this year, during the holiday season, please consider a partnering gift for the ministry and outreach of the Christian Research Journal. Now back to our conversation about Sheila Gregoire with Anne Kennedy. Well, one thing that she notes very prominently on her website is that she's done what she calls, quote, groundbreaking research of more than 30,000 men and women. So what are some of the ways in which this research and her statistics play, you know, a foundational role in her most recent work? And, and she talks about getting research from 30,000 folks. I mean, how did she gather that data? This is the key thing that sets her apart from a lot of other content that's being produced. She she does claim uh, in The Great Sex Rescue that she interviewed or had uh, responses from over 20,000 people and then, or women, and then it, in She Deserves Better, they did a similar kind of, uh, you know, putting out a, a, a survey and then r- getting the responses back and running the survey through their um know, uh, we're analyzing it, is what I mean to say. And I think right now they're doing another one of um, of marriage, both men and women, uh, um, you know, in a couple, a couple will respond to the survey together and then they'll analyze that data. And so this is really interesting because I think one thing that has been unsettling to a lot of Christians is you know, the Bible appears to say a lot of things, but then their experience doesn't, you know, jive with what they're reading in scripture or they're, or they're suspicious of what this, the Bible says. They're, they're the sort of foundation of biblical reasoning and understanding is dissipating like a vapor for evangelicals. And most of them don't know 
um, how to think about life or sex um, in the absence of, of really good or, you know, what was assumed to be good teaching um, through the ages. So uh, into the mix comes data, which is something that Americans overall really are find important and meaningful. So her survey went out. It's a quite long. I haven't seen uh, I haven't seen the questions. I think she has. You can check out her data on a web page, but and then there's like short um, for the Great Sex Rescue a summary of what they what they find and what they believe um, should be taught as a result of what they uh, of what they found and. They had particular criteria for how they judged what people were saying. Uh, so there were two parts of the Great Sex Rescue. One is that they evaluated the books that people really love or have been reading. And then they also asked people about their own sex lives in marriage. And so the the rubric some of the i thought this is real i'm not a numbers person so this part was hard for me i i read a lot of their findings several times trying to orient myself uh, but i thought this was interesting that they how they determined if a book was going to be helpful definitely shaped what kind of data they got back so they asked very particular questions about of the books that they looked at and i'm i'm sure that the questionnaires that people gave in the questions were you know well i don't know but i don't know how um, unbiased they were but they definitely got data that um they felt was very meaningful and important so you know so uh, just an example of a question they would ask of a book that they review would be, does the book acknowledge women's orgasms and women's enjoyment of the physical aspects of sex, or does it imply that most or all women do not enjoy sex? So they would, they would, they have a lot of questions uh, like that, that they, they, they look at the material that they're, um, that's in front of them, and then they determine whether or not it's uh, helpful or not. And, of course, they found that women do not enjoy sex to the degree that they could in marriage. Uh, a lot of women, evangelical women, suffer from pain during sex. They uh, um, There is a difference between the way that men and women think about sex and a lot of, uh, a lot of data like that. And this is really what she uses to shape her own recommendations about how people should approach the subject. And she has a lot of very practical teaching and advice based on the data uh, that she has questions that you as a couple can ask each other. She has sort of short courses that she offers on how to better your sex life and increase your libido. Uh, she she just has a lot of uh, very practical aid that she's that she's shaped by the data she's gathered. So you said earlier that most of her approach to sexuality, particularly obviously in marriage, is more just in the mechanics of it versus more of a theological basis or a theology of biblical sexuality. And so how does she, first of all, identify herself theologically? Does she have a particular theological background? And is her approach and her claims consistent with her advice? Because some of those things that you mentioned in your survey that, you know, you talked about the different questions she asked, Seems like a lot of material that, I mean, the difference is she's asking Christian couples, but it seems like a very more of a secular approach, a sex therapist type of approach to wanting to address that particular issue. Yeah, so she self-identifies as a Christian, 
And I think she goes to sort of a run of a mill, at least for a while, she was going to a Baptist church in Canada. And, you know, she's an, I think she would claim or self identify as an evangelical. And so within mainstream evangelicalism, that's kind of, most people would probably understand or have certain assumptions about how things work. And I think one of the things that people would assume, at least until the last couple of years, is that you uh, you are concerned about sexual immorality or sexual purity, uh, that you are not going to be affirming of the LGBTQ acronym, that you would probably, like most evangelicals, would be conservative on a lot of basic moral questions and and be i don't know like you know what your politics might be but there was a sort of a certain kind of alignment until the last couple of years about sex and marriage and family and i find it interesting she really hasn't jettisoned as far as i can tell the evangelical moniker but she's i would definitely say a very progressive person theologically uh, her assumptions about uh, marriage and family and sexuality are really divergent from what I would call sort of a, a, a conservative evangelical um, world so in uh, she deserves better she really comes out as affirming of the LGBT acronym uh, pretty explicitly and uh, she doesn't show a very nuanced or rich understanding of the Bible. And there's a lot of points at where, a lot of points where what she counsels for young women and girls and their mothers, I think, would really set them at odds with a, a careful and uh, rich reading of the Bible. She She uses... Her, the, her theological worldview, in other words, I mean, and I don't want to sound really critical because I did find that she was kind of a critical voice and I, I don't want to adopt that myself. But she, her, 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 her approach to scripture is, is really shallow. So she uses the paradigm of flourishing and bearing fruit over and over again and what it means to love your neighbor uh, as the measure by which she determines whether whether actions or relationships or situations are bad or good. And that's, I mean, we've seen from Rachel Held Evans through Jen Hatmaker up to Glennon Doyle uh, over, over the years that the question of bearing fruit is not, is used by progressives as a way to get around obedience uh, to biblical commands. So you can say, oh, well, a same-sex attracted couple, we can see in their lives that they're bearing fruit, meaning they have what appears to be a healthy relationship. They're in love. They're respectful of each other. They have good boundaries. Um, they're psychologically and emotionally healthy. They are, quote, then bearing fruit. And so the Bible would say that they're in a good place with God. I found that was like really odd. I was going to ask you about that because on the front page of her website, she says that she says, quote, I believe Jesus when he said by their fruit, you will recognize them and quote, as a result, I'm all about healthy evidence-based biblical advice for your marriage and sex life. But it's like she took that verse out of the context of what Jesus even means. So I thought it was, and she didn't even give a address for it. So I thought it was very odd. Yeah, she, that's, it comes she doesn't up. doesn't define what fruit is. No, she's, I think she's careful not to define what fruit is. And fruit, in some cases, actually, if you were thinking of the fruit of the gospel in somebody's life being obedience to the commands of scripture, she's careful to warn you off of thinking that. And so obedience and fruit are, are set in opposition to each other um, in many places. On her podcast, in the books, 
Uh, and I find that just deeply troubling. It's why I, after a while, when she talks about evidence, I, I began to be really dubious. Like, maybe you have a lot of statistics, but if they those statistics show that you are disobeying what God says explicitly, then I'm not sure what use they are. Now, one of her little monikers also is that she can't stand Christian pat answers. What does she mean by Christian pat answers? In other words, she wants to refute those, but in her mind, what are some of those things that she thinks are not helpful in a Christian marriage? Well, she's she's had a whole book come out just recently where she she has this uh, sort of um, meme that she does called "Fixed It for You," and she takes really well known and common thoughts that you can find in a lot of different books um, all across the spectrum. Some really well known ones, some that are obviously really very unhelpful. Like she, one of the memes is for Mark Driscoll. Um, he says, an independent woman is not fit to be a wife. And she fixes it for him by saying, uh, a man who is threatened by an independent woman is not fit to be a husband, let alone a pastor who shepherds women. So, you know, that's kind of a very silly thing to say. An independent woman is not fit to be a wife. Um, so she fixes it. And that's and, and that might be a, a pat thing that you might see on Twitter in for focus on the family they say our culture is full of damaging messages about marriage and sex and unfortunately even churches have shared harmful teachings that's why we created improving your sex life to improve your marriage an exclusive free rated video series um that's not really a pat answer but that's something that you would see a very common you know it's also true our culture is full of damaging messages about sex and marriage she fixes it and says, we at Focus have also shared harmful teachings. That's why we realize we can't teach on sex until we repent of peddling books and teachings that turn sex into male entitlement and female obligation. So this is a book that she's put out called Fixed It For You. And it's full of these memes with a little bit of extra explanation. And she's... Um, you know, she's quick to point out um, maybe contradictions or places where um, there's been problems or it's just not been helpful. And uh, I mean, on, on what, it, it, to one, to, at least one could say, evangelicals have loved the soundbite over the years. They've really liked to have what turned out to be tweetable quotes that they could blurb or put on literature or quickly share. And I think there's been a huge market for that. And so that is certainly something that one could fairly find annoying and not find helpful. And so she's turned it around to try to make it uh, more about her message, which I find ironically is also very blurbable. She has a lot of quick, easy lines that you could share on social media. So if she is affirming of the LGBTQ perspective, how does she particularly focus on marriage between a man and a woman? I mean, how does she, does she affirm their sexuality, you know, their practice of sexual expression, but she just doesn't say, you know, says, well, that's not my area of expertise or how does she handle that? Uh, the place where she really came out in favor of the acronym was in the She Deserves Better book when she was talking about young um, young adolescent girls. So um, she warns off uh, parents from probably thinking about it in a, a biblical way and and warns them that they should be affirming of their their daughter's uh, sexual um, inclinations. Um, an identity. And, uh, but overall, in most of her content, she is talking about heterosexual marriage and women in particular, what, what women need in order to enjoy sex. And she's big on questions of power and 
that kind of thing. She doesn't think that women can enjoy their sex lives if there's an imbalance of power or hierarchy or anything like that. And so she gets kind of political about things, but her main focus is women's experiences of heterosexual sex in marriage. So speaking of that, and just some of the quotes like you mentioned, she kind of, I don't know, was cherry picking, but tries to find some really extreme quotes from people who are extremely polarizing, like Doug Wilson, or people who have been removed from their ministry, like Mark Driscoll. Um, He's popped up since then, but, you know, he had a big controversy behind him. And she seems to emphasize the fact that there is an unhealthy, maybe hierarchy and power in a Christian marriage that probably from her perspective would come from a complementarian point of view. And so what are her views on hierarchy and marriage? And specifically, she does address the idea of abuse a lot. Yeah, I think she's had a lot of a lot of uh, prescient things to say about abuse. Um, there's been a lot of abuse scandals, uh, a lot of bad things have come to light over the, the last few years. And I I think they, they can't be criticized too much, in my opinion. People who misused their their power or misused women and, and children, that's, you know, there's plenty you can critique. And, uh, but she does, she goes further and says that any power differential in a sexual relationship or in a family is going to lead to abuse. And she's very anti-complementarian. So she writes, I think, and she deserves better. Parents who believe in a power hierarchy, even if they do not practice and actually have a healthy marriage, can unwittingly groom their daughters to fall prey to abusers because they've given the abusers an out, just claim Christian male headship. That's a very representative kind of thing that she says about any complementarian situation. She's really against it. And if you would claim to be complementarian or to believe that some people have certain kinds of authority in certain situations and that power could be exercised in a godly way, she would say that essentially you're just functionally egalitarian and you you may think you're complementarian, but you're not really. And you should dismantle and deconstruct your hierarchies uh, because they will ultimately lead to abuse. And I, I think that's really a naive kind of thing to say. And it also shows a lack of understanding about human nature. It's not biblical, but it just opens the door for other kinds of hierarchical situations that, because they're not overt, could lead to to just the same kind of problems that you're running away from. So I think there's a really good case to be made biblically for order in a family hierarchy. It's not inherently wicked. It can be, it can be exercised wrongly, of course, but uh, I think she's really naive and quick to dismiss something that I don't think she's really probably investigated as not as much as she should. So what does she think the overarching purpose of marriage is? As I mentioned earlier, I thought it was fascinating that her focus on sexuality in particular, while not wrong in terms of some of her focus, it was to the exclusion of things that are very clear in the Bible about marital oneness and procreation, those kinds of things. And so what does she think the purposes of marriage are and how she would maintain her particular view throughout all, you know, phases of marriage, even people like, say, in their 80s, are they supposed to be pursuing as its highest goal passion every time that they come together in marital union? It really does seem like the temporal goods of marriage are for her the highest. So in sex, it would be pleasure would be the most important aspect of a man and wife. 
and then in just a, an ordinary relationship or the regular life that their relationship with each other, their mutual affection, those kinds of goods, um, being able to get along, share housework. She has a lot of stuff to say about how women whose husbands don't share the burden of housework equally with them are going to say they're more unhappy or more dissatisfied in marriage. So marriage is about feelings of satisfaction, feelings of pleasure, feelings of love and affection. And I'm sure that she might say that there is other important goods in marriage, but she doesn't really get into them. And I found that that was really interesting, as you said, but discouraging because I think what one thing that Christian marriage offers that's, you know, um, wonderful and something the world can't even begin to understand, but many people do want, is the transcendence of of meaning and worship. God says that marriage relates to the relationship between Christ and the church. It's supposed to be a picture of what God. Uh, organizes when he redeems the world by his son and joins joins himself to the bride. And so there's a deep theological and spiritual meaning to marriage. And it's hard to see that in the middle of your day-to-day life. But I think it's something that Christians have found to be an important part of, you know, living through this mortal life, which is, I mean, it's hard to say it, but it's full of pain, suffering, disappointment, and sorrow. And that's part of what life is. And a lot of marriages through time are have been very painful and disappointing and not not about not pleasurable. And yet I think you couldn't say that they weren't glorifying to God or that there was no meaning to them or that there was no purpose for those marriages. Uh, and uh, she doesn't really get into the question of the procreative aspect of marriage either, which I think is a big one. <laughs> I think you could definitely want to spend some more time there. So it's very shallow, ultimately. And I think it's a little bit, I, I keep using the word ironic, but it's a little bit discouraging because I think many, many young people, especially today, are starving for the spiritual, the metaphysical, the transcendent, and are exhausted by having a such a narrow world that's entirely focused on what happens now and what kind of pleasure you can experience in the moment. So I want to go back to the fact that you mentioned that she affirms folks in the LGBTQ movement. And so you did say that she you know, tries to tell parents not to discourage their daughters in particular, but what kind of specific advice does she give parents who have children that, you know, declare that they're coming out? Well, she is a big proponent of what she calls comprehensive sex education. And um, one thing she thinks is that, that young people need to know about sex. They need to know about how their bodies work. They need to have explicit uh, sexual instruction. And then they also need to be, you, you really need to be concentrated on what will help them to flourish and what will bear fruit uh, in their lives. And so, you know, she, in the vein of other people says you you really need to um, worry about um, their their feelings about uh, their their relationship with God their um, ne- their relationship with God absent their potential sexual activity as those two things don't necessarily correlate together she just sort of advocates love basically you need to be accepting and to love and to 
try to keep your child from harm and suffering. And that's that should that should be your approach. If you're worried about the sexual purity of your child, she says at the expense um, of everything else, mm-hmm. then you will end up doing a lot of damage and harm to your child. So, I mean, I think she assumes that people who are worried about the purity, the sexual purity of their children are not worried about anything else for their children, which I think is pretty unfair. I don't know of any parents today, maybe, you know, in the 80s, this was the case. I I can't remember because I wasn't that old. But today, parents who are worried about the sexual purity of their children are not worried about that to the expense of everything else. They're worried about their children overall. But sexual purity and falling into bad situations is a big deal because it's even worse than it was in the 80s. What people were warning about in the 80s, you know, they didn't even begin to know how bad it would be. So she doesn't offer very helpful advice. And she really, I think, goes for the scare tactic over actual information that could be useful to somebody who finds that their child is in a same-sex relationship or has that kind of inclination or is, you know, depressed, suicidal. A lot of things can go wrong. There's a lot out there to help Christian parents that you don't need to threaten them with being unloving or not caring for their children appropriately. I think that's something I think people should be really wary of her advice on. It's been a few years, but for probably obvious reasons, one of our top articles on our website of all time is an article we did with a pastor who was formerly on staff with Harvest USA, and it's called Masturbation the Christian. And in it, there is some advice to parents. And I think that in focusing just on sexual acts and what you said, not explaining the actual true biblical meaning of sexuality and why sex in marriage is a picture of Christ in the church, that not having that transcendence, it does, you know, just kind of boil sex down to this purity issue, which is lacking. And by the way, for our listeners, we actually have done an article on that too. You can read our article on Masturbation in the Christian, which is on our website, equip.org. We also have an article um, about being a Christian and um, single and a sexual being by Ellen Dykus. That's also on our website, equip.org. And we have an article that dealt with the term, the whole purity movement. And was that even biblical? And that you can find um, by um, Rich Poupard that is also on our website. And I believe we have a podcast with all three of those topics. But it's interesting that she is um, wanting to have some explicit sex education, but then not giving a reason what, what you know, really defining what the point of sex is in the first place um, from a Christian point of view, which is much more fully orbed than what I hear you describing that she says. Yeah, I think she, she, I think maybe I, I want to assume the best. I think maybe she assumes that people understand the spiritual nature of sex and why the Bible speaks about it the way that it does. But because she doesn't take any of those texts and articulate them for the reader, you know, you kind of have to fill it in on your own. And you're left with, you know, kind of a sea of data and the burden of you know, having good sex while you're in this life, which, you know, would be great. But previous generations of Christians have understood that that's not the highest good because it's so elusive and it can be a gift. It can be a pleasure. It's supposed to be something that is in marriage and it is supposed to be for both people. But if you make it the chief and highest good, you end up, I think, probably not getting it to the degree that you that you thought you would, because really, in life, you should focus on, you should attend, you should seek first Jesus and his kingdom, and then other things 
can be added to you that you might have thought you wanted. And, you know, it's I think it's fine if you're having a really difficult time in your marriage or you're in a lot of pain or you're not able to enjoy sex in marriage. I think it would be very appropriate and good to get help. But I don't think you should get help from an online source or even a lot more number crunching. You should talk to somebody who maybe has good experience in that area and can help you. And it doesn't need to be explicit, probably. It doesn't need to be online advice. And if somebody is going to make gross theological and biblical errors and then also become affirming, then they're probably not somebody that can really help you. Well, I also want to point this out to our listeners. They may not know this, but earlier in the fall, the Christian Research Institute featured a newer book by Nancy Piercy called The Toxic War on Masculinity, How Christianity Reconciles the Sexes. And I would encourage our listeners to listen to the podcast that Hank Hanegraaff on Hank and Plugged had with Nancy, because I found speaking of research and surveys, it totally fascinating. And I would have been wondering what Sheila Gregoire would have made of this research. But one of her theses in this book is that she uses actual sociological research with a lot of people. It's a huge sample. And it's not done by any Christians. It's purely like secular research. And she herself was surprised to find out that the people that were most satisfied with their sex lives in marriage were men and women who were actually in Christian marriages that held to a complementarian point of view and that they were very satisfied physically with their sex lives. So I thought that was really interesting. And she said, this was not like any research done by anybody that was Christian. This was secular folks. And they specifically asked them about specific verses about submission and marriage and all those issues. And it seemed like the people If both husband and wife were devout Christians, then they were satisfied. And then the research showed that people who claimed to be Christians, but were really not practicing, they didn't go to church that much and et cetera, were less satisfied. So those were really fascinating stats. So if someone wants to look into some different statistics from secular sources that are affirming a different point of view, I would point them to Nancy Piercy's recent book. That's really uh, I thought it was fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I, I finished her book recently, and it, it was amazing. Um, she's really clear and I think really fair. She doesn't sweep, you know, bad behavior of Christians under the rug at all or men or anything like that. But I was also disappointed to see Gregoire really come at Piercy online and try to dismiss a lot of her scholarship. And she's done that to other people like Mama Bear Apologetics and so on, she'll just sort of make sweeping claims about other people's work being unhelpful. And I think, you know, that Piercy more than showed her research and her point of view. I thought it was a really excellent book, but I I would have loved to see Gregoire engage with that more charitably and try to understand where people are coming from who disagree with her rather than just you know, sort of blanketing them all as being in the same world as Mark Driscoll or someone like that. Right. I did think that Nancy just made allusions to that in the interview she did with Hank, that really people came after her, um, other women, from the point of view, maybe she was alluding to Gregoire and others, but she kind of said that they didn't interact with the actual research, which she encouraged people, if they get her book, to look it up because it was completely secular research. It wasn't trying to be biased against people who were had a conservative theological view of marriage and sexuality in marriage, and yet had different findings than some of those other Christians, maybe in Sheila's space, who would say that, you know, she puts forth that all a lot, there's so many people who come out of that particular worldview that have bad physical relationships in their marriage. And yet Nancy found research that she herself was surprised by that said the exact opposite. Well, you know, that kind of leads me into the next question, which is we kind of touched on her view of Nancy Piercy, but are there other Christian authors in which 
they address sex and marriage and how does she interact with their work. You know, we you said she kind of makes some generalizations, but has there been any instances? She is very active on social media where she has really engaged with, you know, the bulk of someone's thesis regarding sex and marriage that might have a different point of view than she does. Well, in The Great Sex Rescue, and I think also online and other places, she uses the metrics that she developed to review, you know, whole books or the teaching associated with one kind of person or another. And she'll assign it a metric of, you know, helpful, neutral, or harmful. And I thought it was interesting, surprising that she said that Tim Keller's work his book on marriage, which my husband and I do a lot of premarital counseling, and we really ask that couples read the Keller book because it's a, a really easy, good primer, it, especially if people are newly Christian or don't really know what Christian marriage is supposed to be about. We found it to be very helpful. She found that that book was neutral and that love and respect and sheet music were harmful. And that there weren't very many books, in other words, that she found to be helpful about marriage. And so that's probably a discouraging thing if you're looking for a book that she, well, I guess she has a short list on her website of books that she would recommend. But overall, her tone when she considers other people's work is, I think, pretty dismissive. And I think she, for instance, has appreciated or not disliked Gary Thomas's teaching on marriage, but she is dismissive of him in many blog posts and so on. And when people try to come back and say, well, I, you know, that's not what I said, or that's not what I believe, she isn't a good listener on that score. So there's some sort of dust ups in different corners where people have responded to her characterization of their work and found that it wasn't quite fair. So I think I was a little bit rebuked myself because it's easy for me to just rush in and be really critical of people. You know, there's so much out there that's not helpful. But her her tone and her approach, her manner in approaching other people's work that a lot of people have found helpful over the years, I think is pretty dismissive. And I think, I don't know, data is, I guess, something to consider. But if somebody reads something and finds it helpful, and, you know, d- ends up not getting divorced or something like that. I don't know that you have to just throw everything away that's been written for the last 25 years because it doesn't fit the new metrics that she's developed. So overall, would you recommend her books and her podcast? Because I think on the one hand, I would say maybe she paints a broad brush from people from the other side of the aisle theologically from her. But at the other hand, there are, you know, like you said earlier, we don't want to dismiss actual real abuse that has occurred in marriage or people who have had um, struggles with the physical part of their marriage, their sex life. And so, you know, she is offering a different kind of approach than has been offered before. Now, I do want to say that there are other books that are very frank that come from a different point of view than hers. So she's not, I think she, you know, she would say, well, she's very graphic and explicit, not in a negative way, but just, you know, very frank about how she discusses different aspects of human sexuality and sexual expression in marriage. But there have been other books done that too, from a different point of view, in other words, from a conservative point of view. But, you know, for those people who are looking for those kinds of things, or they think that, you know, a woman's point of view in a sexual relationship in a Christian marriage hasn't been addressed, would you say, oh, you could read her books with some caveats or perhaps people should look elsewhere? How should our readers and listeners evaluate whether or not they should read her books? I think I would have said that The Great Sex Rescue had a lot of helpful material in it. And maybe if I could go in and, you know, cut some pages out, I might let somebody read it. I didn't find she deserves better to be helpful at all. I mean, of course, I have four daughters and I 
I don't want them to be misused by men. I want them to have happy marriages. I want them to enjoy all the goods of marriage. So in saying that I don't recommend the book, She Deserves Better, it doesn't mean that I therefore think that all young girls should suffer, you know, miserable lives before they go to heaven because that's what God wants for them. But I think her assumptions about the nature of life and God and the Bible are deeply unhelpful. And so that I would not recommend that book. I don't think that she has a good view of or a good grasp on male sexuality. And I guess some people would say, well, you know, you can understand male sexuality from a lot of different places. So why would you need one more book about that? But if you are helping or wanting to help men and women in their marriages, I think she really could describe the male experience in a more fair way. And then that would help, you know, I think men and women together in their relationships. I don't think she really has a good grasp on that. And she's pretty dismissive. And so, you know, I don't know about her earlier content. I know she's gone back and revised a lot of stuff that I think people found helpful in the beginning. And not all of her ar archives came over to her new site. So I think she had a rethink. And I'm kind of wishing that I could, you know, see more of her older content because I'm wondering if I would, you know, recommend some of that. But I wouldn't recommend her at this point. I think that she's headed away from a robust biblical view of sexuality. And I think that there's plenty of places to get that everywhere today. So I'm hoping that actually Christians will stop listening to her as much because if she's going to become affirming, I think that's really dangerous. And that will necessarily make a lot of her potentially more useful advice eventually much, much less useful. And I did want to tell our listeners, we have a lot. Um, I mentioned three things earlier that we published on sexuality, biblical sexuality, but we have even more than that. We have one specifically on sexuality for women, just generally. And that is also written by Ellen Dykus of Harvest USA. We have that on our website. We also have, a. if people are wondering about, well, what's allowed and not allowed in marriage, we have a very sharp critique against Mark Driscoll's book about sexuality in marriage by Joe Dallas. You will also find that on our website, equip.org. So we have a lot and we have many, many articles thinking through the whole LGBTQ position and is it biblical, including some that have been written by Anne. So I would recommend you go to our website and check all of those out. And some of these articles, you will find the links in the show notes of this podcast. Well, on a much lighter note than sexuality in marriage, and maybe some of the struggles in that, Anne, it's almost Christmas time. Is there a favorite dish, side dish, or dessert that you like to eat or fix for Christmas dinner? Oh, I really love to make a persimmon pudding, my grandmother's recipe. It's like English Christmas pudding, only it tastes good. <laughs> so I hope to get a chance to make that this month and have it ready for Christmas Day. I have never heard of persimmon pudding before, and I don't know that many of our listeners maybe have eaten persimmon, so maybe they should seek one out. Just make sure that you let them get really ripe. That's the key. Well, thanks, Anne, for being a guest again on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to Episode 370 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Today's guest was Anne Kennedy. She has written an in-depth feature article for our website called Sheila Ray Gregoire, Sex, and the Evangelical Girl. You can read her article for free on our website, equip.org. It is not under a paywall, and our web magazine requires no subscription. Head on over to equip.org. Stay connected with the Christian Research Institute and all the new content we have coming your way. The best way to do that is to head on over to our website, equip.org. There you will find thousands of free resources right at your fingertips, from articles to video to audio 
and it's all for free. You'll find our podcasts hosted there as well as the Bible Answer Man broadcast, which is hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff and streams live every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. In addition, you don't want to miss out on subscribing to Hank Unplugged, which is the podcast of Hank Hanegraaff. And in that podcast, he has really in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people. And in addition, he has a new series on his podcast feed called Hank Unplugged Shorts, which Hank goes into the headlines in the mainstream media and refutes a lot of those cultural issues that we have in these short podcast episodes. And there's quite a few of them. You don't want to miss out on them. Now, if you want to find some of this at other places where it's all in one place, really subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to get all of our content there, our podcasts there, and different individual questions theologically that people have that Hank answers at our YouTube channel. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know how to subscribe to YouTube. I don't have a YouTube account. Well, actually, you might just have a YouTube account. If you have a Gmail address, you have a YouTube account. Just log into YouTube with your Gmail address and search for Bible Answer Man channel, and please become one of our subscribers. In addition, if you see that bell icon right there on our front page, please click that, and every time that we have new content, you will receive a notification that new content is up on our channel for you to be able to consume. So thank you so much for the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. We are grateful for you listening and reading and watching. Mm -hmm.